A byproduct of being literally the biggest thing on the planet is that, of course, you've got a lot of eyes on you at all times, and invariably, people are gonna get weird. Such was the case with Pokemon's peak of popularity in the late 90s and early aughts. Toys, games, cards, television, movies, food, cars, food, food. What kind of shadowy masterminds could have possibly orchestrated such a calculated assault on the brains of our youths? From the moment Nintendo, or whatever ad agency they were working with, unleashed hundreds of children like rabid, starving dogs into a field in a town that had literally been officially renamed Topikachu, Kansas for the day to catch Pokemon merchandise that had literally been dropped out of an airplane, the franchise was, in a sense, as popular with adults as it was the children in their lives. Even beforehand, the first time the majority of the English-speaking world ever even heard the word Pokemon, it was with the words has hospitalized hundreds of children following it. Yeah, it's kind of weird to realize, but this was international news, a year before Pokemon even hit places like the States. Look, it's not like kids were literally spellbound like so many contemporary news spots on Pokemon insisted, but frankly, I kind of get why parents and teachers, two of the most dismally overworked demographics to regularly aid in the development of children, would look at this phenomenon, not have the means to fully grasp it, and go into defense mode. If only there were some higher power that could give us guidance. Or better yet, because there's literally no time to develop my own relationship to God, Draniel just threw up on the floor again and it's not going to clean itself. Uh, if only there were some kind of middleman to tell me what my relationship to God and also Pikachu should be. And if only he was small enough to fit inside my television. Yeah, we all know this clip. Let's just move right past it, because this is nothing compared to where we are going. The guy's name is Phil Arms. He's your standard sweaty, sputtering televangelist. He's got videotapes you can buy if you want to be informed on the sins our society is perpetrating, because apparently you don't deserve to know for free. More importantly than that, though, the guy has books, such as this little number. Huh, I can't imagine why you'd change the cover art when the old one's already perfect. I definitely do not have the constitution to sit through a novel by Phil, though. What I've sampled of his non-fiction work is more than enough. Pokemon and Harry Potter. A fatal attraction is no doubt the man's opus and makes for a wonderful entry into the rich subgenre of conservative Christian literature detailing the dangers of whatever is currently a fad. Communism, hypnotism, and the Beatles. Song as old as time. And right now, the lovely year of 2000, the current fad is Pokemon. And fundamentalist Christians are deeply concerned with the little electric mouse Pikachu and his even more disconcerting friends. Yes, that is right. It's not just this guy somehow. There are book on this subject, and the other one, also from 2000, has an even more insane title, Buying and Selling the Souls of Our Children, A Closer Look at Pokemon. Before I dive in though, I I'd like to lay down my qualifications, or perhaps lack thereof. Uh, despite how silly this all is, it's important to be transparent here, I feel. See, I fucking love Pokemon. It's like the one thing of its scale I will fully mark out over. As a result, I've always extended the franchise more grace than I probably would were I not so bonded to it. Furthermore, I stand firm in the mindset that it has enriched my life for the entirety of the time it's been a part of it, which, doing the math, is almost all of it. More importantly, I honestly have no stakes in God one way or the other. Frankly, just doesn't really have a place in my life, if you can believe it. I find theology interesting, I've seen Neon Genesis Evangelion, I've certainly got nothing against it inherently, and I don't really think it's healthy to treat an entire religion as a monolith, especially one I'm outside of, when it's such a fundamentally personal thing. I 
also believe it's extremely unhealthy to mix business and faith. Thus, my criticisms here are criticisms of the televangelist more than anything. And yeah, that's right, I'm really sticking it to him where it hurts here. I know these guys are low-hanging fruit. For as gauche as I think it can be to build a video out of poking holes in an obviously extremely flawed and frankly stupid point of view, I'll indulge it just this once because the beauty of a poorly worded reactionary argument is that they're so often the ones that lack the filter to obscure the regressive and anti-intellectual intents behind them. As if I haven't already overlaid enough qualifiers to make this video completely meaningless already. This is for fun, above anything else. I think it's kind of easy to guess at what's in these books with just a glance at their covers. Can you hear God's heart breaking? But also, nothing can prepare you for some of the shit in here. Man, would you look at this fancy, embossed cover? This fine leaves something to be desired, I mean, it doesn't even have the full title, but oh man, peep this tagline on the back. Which Shin Megami Tensei game is this? No part of this book may be used or reproduced in any manner whatsoever. So the book opens on an anecdote. Well, more specifically, it opens on Phil bitching about his wife in that weird pseudo-cutesy Chris Pratt Protestant kind of way. Thank God for my insufferable wife, am I right? And then an anecdote. You see, one morning, like his household's sleepy papa bear, he arose to find his son utterly enraptured by a strange cartoon, one featuring mysterious little critters, and wouldn't you know, this show was called Pokemon. And if there's one thing that defines a good, caring father, it's being weird and invasive about the things your child is into. So of course, Phil does his research and finds some very disturbing things. Pokemon is short for Pocket Monsters. Uh, uh, hold on just a second. Let me check the King James Bible for Game Boy really quickly. Ah. Oh boy, God doesn't really like those. Upon sitting his child, Phil Jr. down and explaining the true meaning behind the name, Jr. protested, there couldn't be such things as monsters in this cartoon, but the evidence, my dear viewers, will soon prove insurmountable. This yarn Phil is spinning here of a father and son struggle to see eye to eye on the influence of evil in their world is one he returns to frequently as a framing device of sorts, but it doesn't take more than exercising literally any brain power at all to recognize that it's incoherent, just totally doesn't add up. For what it's worth, I actually do think that being involved and informed in the things your child is into is a good thing, just like, not in this bullshit fear-oriented way so many parents exercise as a replacement for being substantively informed about those interests, but either way, I don't know that I buy Phil is as diligent as he makes himself out to be. See, he shares this other story about a time the junior Phil picked up a book from a pastoral comrade of the senior Phil's off a shelf and was able to identify the occultic symbology in his own toys and videotapes, bagged them up and threw them away. But if this is true, would one not ask the simple question, how did Phil's son do a better job of recognizing the evil in his belongings than the parents who spent their hard-earned ministry money on them in the first place? Like, Phil, homie, isn't warning people of the undercurrent of Satanism permeating our society literally your whole thing? I think you need to review some of your own tapes. Okay, okay, there's been a serious lack of Pokemon in this video, I know that's what we're all here for, let's get this shit on track. So obviously the rhetoric you expect to hear is present. If you're around my age, give or take, there's some shit you probably remember hearing all over from vaguely concerned parents. Phil calls evolution unscientific and its teachers evangelistic, which just, I love that so much. Uh, the evolution argument was the thing I remember most vividly about the state of Christian Pokemon discourse in the era of Pokemania, next to only the concerns over making animals fight, which cockfighting rhetoric surprisingly never comes up in this book. Well, gosh, actually, now that I say that, it makes perfect sense. Uh, adhering to the idea that Pokemon are animals would weaken his argument because he leans really heavy on the monsters part, and in general, his main focus is on all of the occult stuff. 
With that, a lot of the expected logical leaps are also accounted for. He willfully gets shit wrong, and unwillfully, no surprises there, there is an undeniable emphasis on teaching kids to kill. Like, I'm trying really hard not to just sit here and pick at the semantics of this stuff because I'll be here all day, but the funny part about this is that <laughs> killing a scene is just about the worst thing you can do in those first generation Pokemon games. So like, um, that's, that's like definitely Lechonk, right? God, he makes it so easy for me though. Like, he says the line in the opening theme song, you know, about the power that's inside, is indicative of the demonic power children let into themselves in their quest to become Pokemon masters. And like, yeah, that's stupid. But the subtext there so beautifully illustrates what's so wrong with the very core of this book's system of belief. Of course, the power inside is referring to a child's growing sense of agency to make a positive impact on the world, and his reassurance that by having a mutual relationship with nature and with others you'll lead a more mutually fulfilling life. But according to Phil, a relationship with nature is no more than Eastern religious dogma, which the difficult implication of this book is that you shouldn't rely on yourself or on others, where you can rely solely on God instead. Uh, oh, and also he calls the opening theme a rap? Which I think it only qualifies as a rap if the only non-worship music you listen to is the overhead music at Cracker Barrel. But yeah, Phil is, in general, very afraid of Eastern religions, and in being so, is probably ironically one of the first people outside Japan to attempt to identify Shinto and Buddhist theming in the Pokemon franchise. <laughs> in the Pokemon franchise. That uh, doesn't mean he identifies them correctly, though. This term, master, is a non-subtle, in-your-face giveaway to the fundamental nature of Pokemon. Becoming a master is part of the vocabulary and goal orientation of Zen Buddhism, the New Age meditative arts, and other Eastern religions. It would be extremely difficult to believe that the New Age occultic and paranormal nature of the Pokemon game, its plot and its characters, did not emanate from the deeply held belief system of some personalities at the very core of the Pokemon industrial complex. On top of being just a dog shit rhetorical device, it also hammers home that something this book constantly alludes to but never has the capacity to answer is, well, why? What does the Pokemon industrial complex stand to gain from pumping American youths full of demons? What comes after that? There's this part where he half-heartedly alludes to the Porygon incident and talks about its mysterious flashing effect. The science is out there, it's not complicated, but even if it were a deliberate mind control device or whatever Phil thinks it is, why would they use it domestically? There were around 300,000 Christians in Japan in the late 90s, that's like 1% of their population. By that logic, the entire rest of the island nation should be full to bursting with demons already. They don't need the brainwashing or whatever it is. I mean, the real answer to the whys that hang over this book is that evangelism hinges on having an enemy threatening the sanctity of good Christian citizens who maybe don't all go to church as often as they should unless they're kind of scared about something bigger than them, and this time, the enemy is the vague concept of the East and their Trojan horse is Pokemon. Truths to teach children. Three teach that Satan controls the world's systems. Why else would this be a message you want to teach children? It's awfully nihilistic unless you also attach the caveat that the Christians can still win in these three easy steps. Moreover, there's no greater motivator than seeing yourself as a persecuted group and that group makes up the statistical majority in the United States. In continuing to shallowly play into the anxieties of the target demographic of this text, Phil also, of course, spends a lot of time Time assigning violence in children and adolescents to role-playing games. Not just the big stuff though, the classic satanic panic shit, but smaller stuff too. Kids fighting over Pokemon cards, yada yada yada. Uh, look, this is just kid stuff. I guarantee if Phil had it his way and everyone was an abiding Christian, these same kids would throw hands over whether Job loved God more than Noah. Is that allowed?
The time-honored tradition of scapegoating tragedies to the wills of Satan is, in general, really bizarre to me. Like, televangelists can spout numbers they pulled out of a hat all they want, but their sample size of citable actual incidents is awfully small. Kinda seems like Satan's not really as efficient as you guys make him out to be. Are we really sure he's such a threat and that he controls the world's systems? There's something darkly funny about this guy of all people pulling the children can't discern fantasy from reality card while also being the grown man ranting about evil cartoon monsters and the cabals of satanists making a mass media franchise out of them. This is also probably the part of the book I find the closest to actually offensive, just how condescending its attitude toward children is. Children are bright, when provided with the basic facts. They might be a heritage from the Lord, but god, they're so easy to brainwash if you're not constantly inundating them with Protestant dogma. Okay, real talk, now that I've sufficiently guaranteed this video is going to get demonetized, look, I gotta do it. If you like what I do, I have a Patreon. Uh, there's just one tier, it's only a dollar or more, I guess, if you want. I do a funny little Q&A with my wife for each video I make where I talk about the production of each video and answer patron questions. Uh, no pressure, there's no exclusive content over there or anything, just a way to support the things I make. I'm not gonna act like I'm doing especially hard-hitting work or anything, but Patreon is what allows me to keep making the videos I make without compromise. Anyway, thanks for listening. Let's keep it moving. Pokemon and Harry Potter, a fatal attraction, may be credited to one Phil Arms, but it's a Phil Arms book in the same way a DJ Khaled album is by DJ Khaled. By which I mean, at a certain point, Phil utterly disappears from the text and just starts padding the page count with shit other people had already written. There are massive passages in this thing that run as many as 10 pages at a time unannotated that Phil just, like, found online or in other evangelist texts and doesn't even hide the fact that he's borrowing ideas ad nauseum from others. The funny thing is, though, I, he's kind of helping do some of the work for me. Like, this winds up being a beautiful roadmap of other sources for anti-Pokemon fundamentalism from the era. Where else would I have found this shining, precious gemstone of a quote from some New Zealand Herald article? He said promotional materials described various Pokemon as stubborn, headstrong, quibbling, self centered Centered, vindicative, <laughs> obnoxious, hormonal, sexually preoccupied, evil, thieving, and cross-dressing. I'm sure you can imagine writing an entire 150-page book from this perspective about Pokemon and Harry Potter is not exactly easy. Like, there's only so much you can say, which is why Phil makes sure to say everything at least twice. It's serious high school essay shit. He should have secretly made the periods a size bigger too while he was at it. It seriously gets so bad that he calls the final chapter in a nutshell. Come on, dude. There's also plenty of loaded set for phrases he loves to fall back on whenever an argument he's making starts spiraling. Televangelists love the word seduce so much. There's this letter he received from a concerned parent that has the exact same diction as chain letters as well. He's not laughing anymore. I should have counted how many times he says spiritual warfare too. The ultimate joy of getting a book secondhand is when you crack it open and there are some surprise notations in there. Yeah, these aren't mine, I just jot everything down in a Word document. Uh, what's fascinating about this is that I genuinely can't tell if the person marking it up was in favor of or against it. Like, there's a big focus on all of the hyperbole, but I just as readily believe those were the parts that resonated with whoever read it as much as somebody recognized recognizing how manipulative that language is. Oh, and if you were wondering, uh, no doubt what actually is written here in this book is written badly. <laughs> Parents should be concerned when characters are pictured or told about being blown to pieces, poisoned, maimed, butchered, or killed with bloody fury. Wait, this, this is also a quote from another book. In more kindergarten rhetorical devices, he calls Pokemon a gateway drug to more intense forms of roleplay, which, for reasons we'll get into, who boy is loaded. Like I mentioned, there's a lot of citationless gesturing towards statistics, and yeah, there's no bibliography on this bad boy. He'll say where passages he's quoting are from, but that's it. 
uh, a hip tip to anyone who needs it. Uh, if you're ever reading or especially watching something with an informative slant, even something you agree with, and it doesn't cite any sources, you should probably dismiss it entirely if you're not planning to do some fact checking on your own. I mean, you should definitely also just fact check no matter what, even when someone is citing sources. Look at what those are, if they seem trustworthy, and if they do, you'll probably learn a little bit more about the thing that you already learned about that way. Everybody wins. And there's literally no excuse in this day and age to not cite your sources other than that you have no sources to cite. It may sound socially healthy to compromise for the sake of resolution, but the fact is, when it comes to true biblical values and Christian convictions, Christians have far too much to lose to compromise. Unfortunately, the politically correct position today is extremely anti-Christian. The trend in the public arena is to blame social conflicts, political meanness, and religious injustice on the intolerant beliefs of people who claim to be Christians and believe in Biblical absolutes. The politically correct say, you Christians who subscribe. Oh my god, dude, he sounds like fucking Senator Armstrong. Like, even talking about. I hope you're having a good day. And, uh, it's not. I don't know, I hope the next one's better. Oh, fuck me, is it still going? Ugh, let's see. Um, uh. A, a minister used to. Oh, what the fuck? Uh, okay, this is dead ass some of the craziest shit I've ever read in my entire life. Ahem, from the Denver Post. At a church service Wednesday at Grace Fellowship Church, children's pastor Mark Juvera told 85 children ages 6 through 12 that Pokemon is evil. To make his point, Juvera burned Pokemon trading cards with a blowtorch and struck a plastic Pokemon action figure with a 30-inch sword. Juvera's nine-year-old son then tore the limbs and head off a Pokemon doll. During the demonstration, the children chanted, Burn it. The children chanted, Burn it! Burn it! And chop it up! Chop it up! The, if this is real, this is the cultiest shit I've ever read. Very chilling stuff. Uh, if it's fake, Phil dropped it in here as though it's real, and regardless, clearly loves it. Which is also wild, uh, and is also also part of a healthy trend throughout this book to constantly undermine itself at every step. As with any great persuasive text, once it runs out of regular arguments, Fatal Attraction starts inventing counter-arguments to then argue back against. But good old Philip Arm Sr. over here just cannot help but pull these counter-arguments that are, frankly, not even bad? Of course someone always poses the question, oh, but did you not fantasize during games of cowboys and Indians or cops and robbers? In response, Phil argues back that, just kidding, he cites another book full of fundamentalist drivel. Sure, we pretended to kill each other, but when a child pretends to be an adult, they can't fully relate to the experience because it's one they've never had. Unlike being Ash Ketchum, age 10, born and raised in Pallet Town, adventuring with his dear companion Pikachu to become a Pokemon master. In days past, Saturday morning cartoons were far more innocent. Mickey Mouse, Daffy Duck, Bugs Bunny, and Popeye have been replaced with infinitely more sinister characters. Right after that quote, there's this great part where he starts running down the list of 80s and 90s cartoons that are all anti-Christian, and like, okay, I'm honestly a little hesitant to say this because in the event that this dude is still kicking and winds up stumbling across this video, I don't want his heart to explode or anything, but you do know the guy who made advertising to children en masse a thing, which then birthed these shows that you're going on about. Uh, that was the one and only hero and golden child to Protestants the country over, Ronald Reagan. Like, you know that, right? Whenever the advertisement or consumerism angle to Pokemon comes up, Phil always makes a point to stress that, well, the presence of Satan and the occult within Pokemon is the problem. After all, there's nothing inherently evil about money. 1 Timothy 6.10, for the love of money is the root of all evil. Naivete, combined with the fact that parents, some single and others married, are preoccupied with making a living in a very demanding and vibrant economy, greatly 
tempers their involvement in their children's activities. Yeah, demanding and vibrant, that's one way to put it. There's this bit where he's copy-pasted an article about a contest Nintendo held for moms with kids who were Pokemon fans, and the way the winner talks about how the series has greatly deepened her connection to her children, like, I won't front, it really touched me, I got emotional, I think it's really sweet. Phil's take? What I see here is an elongated definition of obsession. Man, fuck off, dude. For as much as Phil props up his son for the sake of argument, I don't see even an ounce of warmth toward the kid that's felt in even a sentence from America's Poke Mom. By far the funniest part of this entire book, though, are the letters he publishes from literal children clowning on him for being a fucking killjoy about everything. What's so great about these is that they're not exactly amazing arguments or anything, they're clearly from children, but it doesn't even take anything more than what's here to get to the heart of Phil's delusions, and his responses where he takes these kids completely seriously only further makes him look like a dumb prick. I am sorry you are angry over the facts. And angry, that's the pseudonym the kid who wrote in. I do have a life. At the finish line, once Phil has neared the end of the space that needs filling in order for his book to hit the market, he ties a nice little bow on everything by resolving the story about his son from the beginning. Finally, one day, I came home and asked my wife, Suzanne, where Philip was. She responded, I don't know, he just grabbed a hammer and went out to the backyard a little while ago. What kind of parental supervision is this? The boy is nine years old, what's he doing unsupervised with a hammer? Jesus Christ! Suddenly, I heard an explosive bang, bang, bang that caused me to run to the window overlooking the back porch. There I saw my son, Philip, on the porch with all 65 pounds of his 5'4 fr- Oh my god, your son is extremely malnourished, dude, are you feeding him sawdust? being thrown into the process of smashing his beloved Pokemon game into thousands of pieces with the hammer. Yeah, so again, I don't really buy this story, at least not in the highly narrativized version we see here. Why would Phil have bought a Game Boy in the first place if he's so good at his job? If his first introduction to Pokemon was through his son watching it on the television, where did this game cartridge come into the picture from? But if we presume every word of this is true, hell, even the sentiments therein, he's painting a picture of a relationship where his attitudes and disposition have warped his son's development little brain into seeing pious behavior as the primary means to get affection and validation from his dad. I'm sure that sounds like a crazy reach, but look, throughout this whole book, a sort of missing piece of the puzzle hangs heavy. The reliance on repetition and assembling quotes from other sources without commentary, the inconsistency of his personal anecdotes, the, the fact that Harry Potter is on the damn cover of the book but gets like 10 pages total. What's the secret to Big Philly style? Are you ready? Drag. It's drugs. Yeah, party's over, everyone. We have to get sad for a second. These are just, uh, these are just vegan omega-3s. Uh, it's not... Don't worry. It's fine. I'll... I haven't taken one today, hold on. Yeah, so this book was published a mere two months after Phil Arms was forced to publicly confront that he was stealing money from his ministry and using it to fund a prescription pain medication addiction. You might expect me to embellish this, really lean into how wild that is, but honestly, I can't really bring myself to find the hubris here especially juicy. First of all, this just should not surprise you if you know literally anything about televangelists. These men are con artists. I don't doubt that they sincerely believe the bullshit they peddle, but they're still peddling bullshit at the end of the day. It's practically a part of your training in this business to have the Jimmy Swaggart style of weeping for forgiveness before a live studio audience down to a science before you ever step in front of a camera. M more than that, though, I'm going to be perfectly honest 
past here, so don't be weird about it. Prescription drug addiction has done real damage to my family. I've lost people to this shit, and the image of a child so inundated with religious paranoia that he throws away or destroys his once precious belongings because his dad swacked out on painkillers insists it's going to fundamentally poison his spirit makes me a little sick to think about. Oh, for fuck's sake, there's still a whole other book! <sighs> In conclusion, it turns out it's really hard to write a full-length, regular-sized book full of pop-cultural snake oil while you're busy nursing a prescription drug addiction. And for as much as Arms already positions himself like the discount version of the other pastors he likes, he could have stood to take one final page from another, John Paul Jackson, and his book, buying and selling the souls of our children. A closer look at Pokemon. The joke is that this book is tiny. Thankfully, no personal tragedies or controversies to bring this guy down, as far as I can see. Totally unsurprisingly, later in his career, he went hardcore rapture freak mode, but that's basic shit with these guys. You might notice that his Wikipedia page that definitely wasn't penned by the man himself makes no mention of this title, although I can't imagine why he'd be ashamed of something like that. I actually don't know if this one came out before or after the ARMS book, but I don't really care. My copy isn't in great shape, it looks pretty water damaged, so it probably sat in someone's basement for the past 20 years, or I don't know, maybe it's so good that the previous owner just couldn't stop blasting rope while reading. It's none of my business. Really quickly, let's establish the stuff in here that was already in Phil's book. I don't want to repeat myself here. And there's unsurprisingly a lot of crossover. Oh man, this guy's scary. Jackson also loves the word seduce. You get that classic, it's just a game. Or is it? Oh my god, I just threw up a little bit. Uh, Anti-evolutionism, he calls Eastern religions idolatry, he lists all the same shows as arms when talking about the surge of witchcraft on TV, the obligatory allusions to Sean Sellers are present in both, kids these days can recite every Pokemon but not even a single verse from the Bible. Yeah, because the Bible's boring as shit and Pokemon is cool and fun. Got a better angle, guys. Christian art doesn't have to all be bad. Look at like Sufjan Stevens and The Chariot and Paramore, they make it work. I know when Magic the Gathering hit big, some Christians got together and like prayed really, really hard until out came Redemption, the biblical card game, but man, this font is kind of making my eyes want to bleed. What? Hard bondage. Okay, maybe you guys are with it after all. That rundown isn't to say this book doesn't have its own identity, though. All over, it's much doomier, despite using less emotionally loaded prose. Like, ARMS will talk about occult forces affecting our moods and behaviors, but Jackson straight up ascribes it to sickness and death. Uh, believe it or not, this one actually has a work cited, which has the hilarious side effect of making the claims that don't have citations next to them look all the more dubious by comparison. Uh, this book has a single rhetorical device, all in all, that it uses over and over. He introduces some kind of grim tale and then pulls a gotcha that much the same principles can be applied to the effects Pokemon has on our children's minds. He uses that easily debunkable folk legend about Inuits using frozen knives to kill wolves, the boiling frog. Bizarrely, he references the game episode of TNG, which like, is this a show about aliens? Is, is that not also occultic? What are you doing watching this? See, the way the figures in the these stories don't even realize how enraptured they've become in their vice until it's too late. This is much like the plight of the child in a world full of Pokemon. In fact, in one instance, he describes Psyduck's psychic headaches this way. You see, your kid's gonna be uh, so full of negative psychic energy from all the demons they're inviting inside them that they're gonna get cluster headaches. The real magic in this book, and what I hoped for so badly as I waited for these books to arrive, is how much shit about Pokemon it gets wrong, and all these splendid, sublime ways it does so. For example, he says Pokemon is unsophisticated. God damn it! Pokemon is plenty sophisticated! Its systems are open-ended and flexible such that you can play through it casually or impose challenges on yourself in 
any number of ways to make different parts of the experience more fun. It's a vehicle for creative play. It's not for babies. Fuck. I really don't know where this guy is getting his info from. Like, 28 feet long definitely refers to Onyx, but there weren't any Pokemon that weighed more than 1,900 pounds for a really long time. Snorlax is only around half that weight. Okay, but seriously, here's the really crazy shit. Devadrio is the first Pokemon he specifically talks about in any depth. A halfway decent flying type Pokemon in Generation 1, but far from a mascot. It didn't even get a plush until, what, 2019? But it hides a dark secret. See, its three heads are a clear-cut parallel to the counterfeit trinity, and moreover it has the potential to become a god. Wait, 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 he doesn't mean... Yes, much like me, Hazel, at age 8, but unlike me, Hazel, at age 11, this man, this published author and minister, fell for the old beat the elite for a hundred times trick, and thinks Poke Gods are a thing. By name! Although I have no clue what the fuck he means about Ash becoming a god, and if you were wondering, Dodrio wasn't even one of the popular Pokemon to spread Pokegod rumors about. Like, it was mostly Mewtwo and Meryl and Doomsday and shit. But yeah, oh my god, is that like really everything there is to say about this fucking book? I mean, look, it, it goes down how you'd expect. I don't really know why I expected this to be so different from the other one. From a structural perspective, I probably would have just rolled the arguments in both into one another, but I didn't want to muddy all this shit about Phil Arms. Like, it, that, that, that had kind of a deliberate str- Wait, oh, oh my god, what the fuck? As Christians, we are called to die to fleshly passions and desires. Not to mere actual deeds. Sensual passions and desires are the seeds that produce evil behavior. Did you realize that whatever we fantasize about matters to God? He is intimately aware and involved in our spiritual development. As Christians, it is critical that we censor our imaginations, because wrong thoughts can easily become wrong attitudes that give birth to sinful actions. Emotions can manifest with equal force, whether incited by fantasy to see or reality. This fact alone fuels the pornography industry. Whoa, 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 whoa. Slow down there, slugger. This comes after a section about Pokemon teaching kids about meditation. D did this get pasted in here by accident? Once in my adult life, I've had to attend a sermon, and therein I noticed a fascinating compulsion in the pastor to, when either referring to various sins or struggles God can guide you through, make a specific point to, among other more universal examples, allude to addiction to internet pornography. Every time he said it, he kind of dipped his head down, the pained expression flashing across his face for just a fraction of a second. But yeah, that's kind of the last worthwhile thing in this book for my aims, because after page like 64, the entire rest of this book is this really handy index to all of the Pokemon, their abilities, and how and when they evolve. Great stuff. Next time I need to recall what level Seal evolves into Dugong, I'll simply consult this. Unsurprisingly, the logical soundness of these texts never had any pretense on their value in the free market. By playing into the emotions and morals of neurotic, imaginatively restricted parents across America, you don't need logic to begin with. But I don't mean to paint the picture that it was only the Christians who were caught up in concern over Pokemania. It's the funniest and most blatantly off base, but there were plenty of weird arguments and criticisms from the secular world. Like, when Americans found out that Satoshi Tajiri was gulp a recluse from a frankly extremely cruel Time Magazine spot I don't have the time to get into here, uh oh, what if my child turns out like him? An introvert? We have to remember that this was still an era where it was like expected that you would just be racist on site if the topic of foreign cars came up in conversation. Parents might not have had the language or even the conscious thought to know that some of their confusion and concern was rooted in holdover red scare skepticism about the East, but it was there. Which is weird too, because the vast majority of non-religious criticism Pokemon received from parents and from the media was how it nestled into consumerism, even if they'd never call it that outright. Ironically, also because these were Cold War babies who were actively dissuaded from contextualizing why some parents had to work three jobs to put food on the table for their children. 
One of the essays featured in the book Pikachu's Global Adventure argues that the discomfort adults in the Anglosphere had for Pokemon came from the schism of seeing children practice consumerist excess, something they should be shielded from until adulthood, where consumerist excess is considered the norm and even the end goal. I can definitely see that, although there's another angle I observed as well. Uh, I joked about parents and teachers at the start of this video, but they were for real some of Pokemon's harshest critics, citing how it caused squabbles among kids and things like that. And when you hone in on those criticisms, you see an unwillingness and sometimes inability to teach their children how to use Pokemon to develop important skills like moderation, sharing, and resourcefulness, and even compromise, who instead then want to just see it go away overnight. Pokemon cards, Tamagotchi, and the like were all banned from my elementary school, and honestly, I think that's fine. But the strong-armed approach definitely got weird when I was in junior high and they ushered in a ban on cell phones. Like, I remember seeing one girl literally have her friend group shield her, like 360 huddle around her, so she could take a phone call from her mom in secret without getting her phone confiscated. But having a no exceptions rule in place is certainly easier than exercising judgment every single time someone is seen with a flip phone. With that in mind, it's no wonder a class action lawsuit was being filed against Nintendo by a group of parents who insisted the cards were hooking kids on gambling, even though baseball cards were doing the same exact thing since the 50s. Catholic win though, you guys loved Pokemon, somehow. Famously, the Italian Bishops Conference issued a statement insisting the Pokemon was morally enriching, hell yes. And US Catholic loved the first movie and said the story of Ash and Mewtwo was a Christ-like parable of the futility of force. You may also wonder what concerns were there about Pokemon domestically at the time. While there's no way to be sure of the extent without simply having been there, pulling once again from Pikachu's Global Adventure, and mind you, this book was published in 2004, barring controversy over the Porygon incident, they were only able to find one Japanese language article that mentioned Pokemon in an outwardly negative light regarding its relationship to children. That sentence is a mess. The article in question, it had thankfully been archived so I was able to look at it in full, shouts out to the internet archive, is primarily about the obfuscation of evolution in science classes, and mentions offhandedly that the gap and understanding that would leave for children would then be filled in by works of fiction like Pokemon, if I'm understanding right anyway. There are no doubt dozens of factors to this, but I suspect part of it is simply that Pokemon wasn't an overnight success domestically, where in places like the States it just kind of appeared out of nowhere and was suddenly on everybody's mind where once there was nothing. I gotta be honest, I really just want to do a video about Pokemania in its totality at some point and may or may not have done a lot of the research while working on this video and kept having to fight myself to save the really good stuff for that video for the sake of scope, so uh, here's a little sample of just one of the things I can't wait to talk about. Every single solitary card is a gem mint 10. Let me repeat this. Wow. You, what that means is that you are getting Chikolita in a gem mint 10 perfect. Yes, you've seen that card at $400 a card. You are getting Barefu in gem mint 10 in the deal. Yes, you've seen that at $400 by itself. It is in the deal in gem mint 10. You are getting Magum Rashi in gem mint 10. You are getting Baku Fun in gem mint 10. You are getting Odero. You know, originally I wanted to end this video talking about all the different ways I think Pokemon have the capacity to better the lives of the children who grew up with it, but looking at my notes Notes, it's all kind of sentimental and preachy and gay, so let's just close on something fun instead. I think these books came out just before the English-speaking world can learn about all the aspects of Pokemon that were trimmed off before shipment overseas, so there are a lot of really hilarious omissions that would have made their arguments way stronger. This is shit the internet has been talking about for like 20 years, so it's nothing revelatory, but like, could you imagine if these guys knew about Misty's tears, James's tits, the drunk old guy in Viridian's 
City, the guns in the Tauros episode, all the times Misty slaps Ash, Brock's entire song about being a MILF hunter, or literally anything going on with the electric tale of Pikachu manga, not to mention this blatant piece of homosexual propaganda. I mean, this Pokemon is literally named Squirtle. 